Welcome to the Algonquin Logging Museum. In a few moments, you will be stepping back in time 175 years to the earliest beginnings of logging in what is now Algonquin Park. On your journey, you will visit a whole series of exhibits that will trace this remarkable story from the 1830s right up to the present. A present that owes its beginnings to mighty struggles in far off Europe. 1808, war between Britain and France. When Napoleon managed to cut off Britain's source of shipbuilding timber in Northern Europe, a desperate Mother England turned to her colonies for the timber necessary to maintain her navy. This was the impetus that firmly established the great pine timber industry in what is now Ontario. Spurred by an insatiable market and dreams of prosperity, the loggers lost no time. Cutting their way up the Ottawa and its tributaries, reaching these highlands in the 1830s, 60 years before Algonquin became a park. The timbermen toiled all winter, cutting the giant red and white pine, only the choices was taken, tall, straight, and free of knots. The supply seemed endless as they pressed ever onward, hurling down the pine. The massive timbers were squared as flat as tabletops, then skidded by horses to nearby frozen lakes and rivers. There they were stockpiled until spring breakup. How they labored, those loggers. Heavy, brutal work from dawn until dark, day after day, far, far away from their homes in the outside world. They lived in camboose camps, simple log shanties, 50 men in each. While they cut, the shanty was their home, bunkhouse, cookery, everything they had. And this life, this uncompromisingly harsh life, once was the occupation of over half the able-bodied men in Canada. Tough as the winter cutting life was, it could not compare with the labor that awaited those timbermen brave, broke, or foolish enough to sign on for the river drive. In the spring, rivers swollen by melted snow were the highways that carried the winter-cut timber from the Algonquin Highlands to the seaport of Quebec. Log dams raised water levels to accommodate the timbers. Wooden chutes allowed the so-called sticks to be carried around rapids and waterfalls. The drive, hour after hour, day upon day of death-defying work in bone-chilling water. Down its tributaries to the Ottawa came the masses of timber, there to be lashed into immense rafts for the long, dangerous journey down the Ottawa and St. Lawrence. Through rapids and chutes, through terror and danger, and for some an abrupt and unrecorded death before the end of the drive in Quebec. Quebec City where the river drivers were paid off and the squared logs fitted securely into the holds of timber ships bound for England. Canada's square timber trade peaked in the 1860s. But during this time, new markets opened up in the United States. Markets that called for saw logs that could be turned into lumber on this side of the Atlantic. And big business it was. By the turn of the century, one of the old timber barons, J.R. Booth, employed 4,000 men in the bush and 2,000 men in his mills. And he went on to develop what was reportedly the largest company in the world controlled by one man. And much of his trade depended on Algonquin Park timber. Soon, new inventions made logging more efficient. The cross-cut saw replaced the axe and steam-powered tugs, called alligators, were built to tow log booms across lakes. By 1896, J.R. Booth had completed his Ottawa, Arnprior, and Parry Sound Railway across Algonquin Park, an even better way to haul timber and supplies. With the coming of the railway, sawmills were built closer and closer to the source of logs, including this St. Anthony Lumber Company mill, 
constructed in 1895 at Whitney, just five kilometers south of here. In 1893, during this period of vigorous logging industry development, the Algonquin area was set aside as a park. Then, as now, many people in Ontario were concerned about the depletion of forests, water, and wildlife. But the creation of Algonquin was not intended as a means to prevent logging of the area. In fact, lumbermen supported the park concept because land clearing for settlement would be stopped and the accompanying fire hazards substantially reduced. One logging company actually requested that the park's boundary be extended to include its cutting limits. Only later did occasional conflicts start to develop between logging and the park idea. One reason was a dramatic increase in the number of visitors. As early as 1938, in fact, the park superintendent noted that a distinct clash between the tourists and loggers was developing. Technology, too, was changing. Chainsaws and trucks appeared in the 1940s and mechanical skidders in the 1950s. The new logging methods, while undeniably more efficient, created noise and visual impacts that conflicted with the wilderness experience that more and more people were seeking in Algonquin Park. So, by 1940, in an effort to separate lumbermen and recreationists, logging was prohibited in the shoreline areas most used by park visitors, and many more restrictions have been put in place since then. And yet this was but one of the concerns park managers were facing. It soon became clear that an overall management plan was required to regulate the many conflicting demands on Algonquin Park. The first plan, issued in 1974, after years of study and public participation, was based on the Ontario government's policy of managing the park for its timber production, recreational use, and environmental values with as little conflict between them as possible, a concept of multiple use. And the plan is reviewed regularly and modified to reflect current values and management directions. Within the current plan, Algonquin is divided into a number of zones, each with clearly specified purposes. 35% of Algonquin is occupied by wilderness, development, nature reserve, natural environment, and historical zones, where no cutting is allowed. About 65% of Algonquin is termed recreation utilization zone, where forestry is allowed. However, low-intensity recreation, such as canoeing and protection of ecological values, has first priority and to this end, cutting is prohibited along all waters and portages and adjacent to key habitat areas. This results in actually only 51% of the park being available for forestry. In any given year, logging operations are confined to a number of small, widely spaced areas approximately 1% of the park. Algonquin's forests are managed by a crown agency called the Algonquin Forestry Authority. Its work is regulated by a 10-year forest management plan and is inspected and approved by Ontario Parks staff. Historically, Algonquin's forests have supported the communities and the lives of many area residents. Algonquin's contribution to the region's forest-based economy remains very significant today. You don't have to look any further than Whitney and Barry's Bay to see how important these forests are to local communities. In fact, today's foresters are responsible for balancing the needs of many park users with the science of sustainable forest management. Concepts like ensuring ecological integrity, emulation of natural disturbances, sustainable forest management, forest certification, public and Aboriginal involvement are what today's foresters, biologists and park planners strive to achieve. The Algonquins of Ontario, first inhabitants of the Algonquin Park area, play a key role both in planning and forest operations in Algonquin Park. Partial cutting systems which retain forest cover at all times are used on the majority of area harvested. In all cases, the trees to be cut or retained are individually marked by certified trained tree markers. Just how are the forests of Algonquin managed? On the western uplands, the forests are mostly hardwoods like sugar maple, yellow birch and beech. Here, the foresters most often use a selection system 
under which only certain mature or defective trees spaced throughout the stand are removed in each cut. While ensuring designated trees are always left for wildlife habitat. The sunlit openings that are left stimulate the growth of the remaining trees and this actually speeds up the production of wood from what would occur naturally. Under this system, cutting is repeated on the same area about every 25 years, and many large trees remain standing in the forest at all times. Several years after harvesting, there are few obvious signs that cutting has taken place. In the second major forest type within Algonquin, the red and white pine stands of the east side, the forest is managed using a uniform shelterwood system. Through a series of four harvesting cuts at intervals of up to 20 years, designated trees are removed while others are left standing to provide seed and the ideal light and moisture conditions on the forest floor to favor pine regeneration. By the end of the cycle, almost all of the original sheltering trees have been removed. But by this time, a new generation of 40-year-old young pines is already established on the harvested area. This system attempts to replicate understory burns and stand replacing fires, which shaped the east side forests and were quite common before the days of fire suppression. The final silvicultural system used is the clear-cut with standards system. This system is used on less than 5% of the area harvested and is necessary to maintain the natural diversity of the forest while creating the early successional habitat favored by wildlife such as the white-throated sparrow. Tree species such as poplar, jack pine, red pine and white birch are managed using this system which mimics natural disturbances and creates open sunlight conditions to germinate and grow new seedlings. Today's controlled and scientific logging is a far cry from the rough and ready days of the Camboose camps and the river drives. The simplicity of the past has given way to the complexity of the present. Technological advances in today's equipment has reduced the danger of falling trees by hand and allow loggers to work effectively within a complex set of rules to harvest and renew our valuable forest heritage. And yet, through all of this varied and colorful history, there runs a strong thread of continuity. The loggers of today are often the great-grandsons of the lumberjacks of yesterday. The trees we cut now are descendants of the trees left by those first rugged pioneers who came to the Algonquin Highlands almost two centuries ago. We invite you now to step back in time into that era to see how the first hardy lumberjacks lived and worked in the remote Algonquin Highlands how they drove the logs down wild rivers to the Ottawa and St. Lawrence, how logging changed over the years and gradually gave rise to the managed and sustainable forestry practices of today. And now, back to the 1800s.